Welcome to 5 Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Mark Simpson. Mark is a UK-based deep value investor and author with over 15 years of experience investing in individual securities. He writes about finding sources of edge in the market, investor psychology, avoiding investment mistakes, and building better portfolios. Today we're going to be discussing his book, Excellent Investing, How to Build a Winning Portfolio. Let's ask Mark five good questions. But first, I'm happy to announce my literary debut, The Rebel Allocator, is now available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. You could say it's about time. I've been pouring my heart into this book for more than three years. A well-known SoCal billionaire received an early copy of the book and actually called me to say he enjoyed the story and was adamant that I get it made into a movie. Talk about a surreal experience getting 20 minutes on the phone with one of my heroes. My friend Tobias Carlyle had this to say. Jacob Taylor has written a modern-day investment classic. The Rebel Allocator is reminiscences of a stock operator for value investors. It's a fictionalized retelling of the lessons in The Intelligent Investor in an accessible page-turner. If you want to learn how to invest like Warren Buffett by sitting at his knee, this is the book for you. Wow, how flattering is that? I was blown away when he sent me that. I've created dozens of ad-free author interviews over the last five years and never asked for anything in return. If you've gotten any value out of these efforts, please do me a personal favor and pick up a copy of The Rebel Allocator. I promise you won't regret it. And now, on with the show. Hi, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Mark Simpson, and he's the author of Excellent Investing, which I have right here. Mark, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. So I thought before we got started, uh, you could talk a little bit about why you were inspired to write this book. Well, uh, yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, I, I, I've tried to write the book that I would have liked to have read when I had maybe two or three years um, experience of investing. Um, so when I, I started investing back in um, uh, about 2003, and um, I've always had quite a technical background, uh, a maths degree. So, um, uh you know the analysis side of um you know investing always came quite naturally um but i found that you know i was still making these you know th- these these investment errors mm-hmm. um and um you know at, at the time it started to become popular to um you know people started writing books about behavioral biases and um you know i started learning about those and you know kind of became fascinated by the psychology side of investing as well um but it, it seems to do nothing for my actual ability to overcome <laughs> to overcome these errors. Right. I mean, um, I think that's and, what Kahneman would say. Like he know he identified all these things, and yet he still falls prey to them. Uh, exactly. He said, "Yeah, it makes me better at spotting other pe- you know the mistakes in other people. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> I, I don't make better decisions myself. And um, you know, so, so I sort of um, uh, I, I guess my um, uh, my journey tracks the, the the three parts of the the book that I've written. And, you know, the, the first part was was realizing that it's not enough for me to be um, you know intelligent or experienced um, in, in a market where everybody is intelligent and experienced. That 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 isn't a competitive advantage. That doesn't give me you know market beating results. Um, I had to find areas where the market structure meant that other people couldn't use their intelligence or their experience to full, full advantage and I could um, so the first part part of the book kind of talks about what I think of some of those advantages you know particularly that individual investors can have um, in the market um, and then the second part of the book is um, m- my journey to discover rules to overcome these behavioral biases um, it it doesn't always sound like the ideal or the optimal decision making framework is to, is to make you know restrict your options um but you know there's a lot of precedent i think atul gawande you know wrote a famous book the checklist manifesto mm-hmm. um you know where, where uh, just applying a checklist to uh, surgery had a big impact on the um you know the, the avoiding um avoidable errors um in surgery um so Although it's very hard to do it in the moment, I found that I could create these rules for myself that would, um, you know, sort of prevent me making some of these more obvious investment errors. Um, And then finally, um, my kind of realization was that I it wasn't enough for me, um, you know, to be a good stock picker. 
you know, it, yeah, you need to be a good stock picker um, to, to beat the market. But um, being able to build those into a coherent portfolio was almost equally important. Um, and, and that's the, the, the kind of third part of the book is where I take through a, a methodology for position sizing and for um, for trying to um, uh, yeah, build a better portfolio. Um, and, you know, looking, you know, looking through the market, um, I didn't see a lot that was in this area. So I, I guess I decided to write the book myself. <laughs> and <laughs> I, hopefully it does does the concept justice. I think that's how the best books usually get written is they're the author scratching their own itch that they can't find uh, out there otherwise. So yeah. uh, question number one is, why do you think that the market cap space is particularly inefficient? So I think um, micro caps, um, you know, are um, inefficient simply because there's less competition. Um, the, um, you know, the, the typical uh, market participant is a, um, a, a fund, you know, whether it's a, a hedge fund or a unit trust or something like that. And um, what matters to them is scale. Um, the compliance costs they have are relatively fixed. The administration costs are, are relatively fixed. So if they want a profitable business, they need scale. Um, and that means that sort of, you know, ho hopefully they generate that by, you know, market beating returns, but but not necessarily. But but once they have scale, um, it becomes very hard for them to invest in these smaller companies. Um, the, um you know, the, the reality is um, they just won't get the liquidity that, you know, and when they don't get liquidity, um, they choose to, to just ignore this space. Um, and if you're a, an individual investor, um, the other people when you're buying who are selling, when you're selling, buying um, will be other individual investors like yourself. Now, doesn't guarantee they're uninformed. There's a lot of very um, smart and um, informed individual investors out there. Um, but it, it does mean, for example, they won't have probably had preferential access to management. Um, they um, and the average und uh, average individual investor in most studies underperforms the market, and they do so by making you know poor investment decisions. Um, so if you can. Uh, manage to correct your decision making in this space, um, then you know I believe you can have a, um, a an advantage with the very small um, companies. So, do you even ever look at at bigger companies, or is it that's like that? I'm, I'm going to save my kind of research uh, expenditure time and, and energy only for the smaller spaces. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it's a, it's a difficult one because you know I I probably like you look at some of the larger companies. Um, I'm a, a a deep value investor, so I'm looking for um, you know the things the market hates. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and I believe I'm get you know if the market hates it enough, I, I'm probably going to get some under you know undervaluation there, um, but. Um, and I do believe you get this in the large cap space. It's, you know, the market does, you know, you look at the 52 week highs and lows of e even mega caps, they can be different by 50% or more. And, uh, and I, I don't think that's, you know, efficient, yeah, yeah e efficient pricing. Um, what what I would say, though, is, um, I, I, you know, if if I'm do I find it a lot harder to do that, and I tr you know the temptation is there, but I'm try you know I, I think the discipline is um, I try to just focus on the you know the kind of smaller companies um, because you know I, I might generate I might be able to gauge market sentiment and say well this is really really hated so I'll buy it uh, and then be able to sell it when it's lo loved but I'm that's not really my my strength you know and it, you know often if i've done that it's more luck than yeah um, skill. than judgment <laughs> yeah yeah and i wonder too it seems like the micro cap space is is maybe not so much hated as just simply ignored yes um it's very um uh yeah and it's getting worse as well i think particularly With in indexation. europe um yeah so, so um yeah 
I think, you know, you see a lot of money going into the FTSE 100 or the S&P 500 trackers, um, and then you get a valuation gap between them and the, you know, uh, even the mid caps. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the further you go down, you typically are getting better earnings growth, um, lower multiples, and, um, you know, s- sometimes more financially secure companies as well. Um, you have to be careful of saying, um, you know, th- there is this small cap premium, you know, that historically small caps have performed, um, but it's, um, it, it can be quite tenuous. You know, even the, I think it was Rolf Bantz did the first paper and he, in eight, 1981, and even there, he's not saying, well, this is an inefficiency. He's saying th- this could well or... just be, yeah, it, exactly. It could be risk. And it's maybe not completely volatility because he said, you know, he showed there was a, you know, a, even a, a, a volatility adjusted um, you know, market premium for small caps, but that, you know, there could be other forms of risk that are not captured by volatility, for example. Um, but I think um, the reality is that, um, uh, uh, well, I think another study was by Cliff Asness, um, which he sort of cleverly called, um, uh, let me get this right, um, size matters if you control your junk, I think was his uh, <laughs> his his comic title to that one. Um, and uh, he, he found that, you know, despite all the criticism of the small cap premium, um, you if you get rid of the worst quality companies, you know, the ones that are maybe stock promotes or have terrible finances or no revenue, you know, you, you end up with a, you know, a, a, a still an outperformance for small caps. So even if, you know, you don't, you know, it, 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 even without the chance of finding um, in if more inefficiency in that market, it, it, it sort of, if you can play in that market, it's worth doing because you should capture that extra premium risk or otherwise by buying the micro caps. Yeah. So question number two, uh, Wes Gray, who's been on the show, has a, this concept that he's called the God portfolio, uh, which I thought was pretty clever. Uh, but w- maybe you could explain what that is. And, and then what does it mean for us t- as far as knowing ourselves as investors? Yeah, great question. I, I, I really like this study by, by Wes Gray, you know, not just because of the, the sort of clever title, but um, he asked the question, what would happen if we um we used a look ahead bias we you know we we invest in a portfolio that we knew for certain was or, or would be the best performing i think it was 50 stocks so 10 percent of the s p 500 over the next five years um and of course the performance of this is just phenomenal you know it, it's like yeah, it's- 30 percent a year it's you know, that, 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 <laughs> exactly that, that's in no way surprising um but what is surprising is the path that those returns take um so he found that in the kind of long run data there are at least 10 occasions when you had a, a 20 percent or, or greater drawdown and one of those was a gut-wrenching you know 75 percent drawdown um uh, uh, and when you look at it like that, um, you know, it, it kind of I mean, I think his uh, his clever comment was um, even God would be fired as an as an active manager. That's right. <laughs> um, um, but I, I think the the sort of wider message to investors is um, you will always face periods of, of drawdown and underperformance. Um, you know, nobody's strategy um, performs you know, perfectly every year, every quarter, or even every, you know, five years, ask sort of um, book value, deep value investors over the last probably 10 years now. Yeah. And, you know, uh, they're, uh, <laughs> um, they're, they're, they're waiting for their time in the sun to come again. You know, it's been a long, a long period of underperformance. Um, so it, if every investor goes through this, the question is what what are you going to do about it um and unfortunately most investors their reaction is they chop and change mm-hmm. um they jump from you know okay i'm uh, you know 
I, I invested deep value in you know 2009 2010 you know i go through underperformance um you know late cycle they jump into growth or you know late cycle of growth they jump into value or you know it, it becomes a um it, it, i think my favorite example of this is um there's a guy called ken hebner and he he was the best performing fund manager from the decade ending 2009 and he generated 18% compound return for investors or sorry his funds generated 18% compound return um internally um and bearing in mind this is uh, includes the great financial crisis and the tech bubble burst that that's a, a great return yeah the average investor generated minus 11 percent in his fund and you think how you know how, how can you underperform by 29 percent a year uh, per year in the uh, in one security <laughs> yes yeah, yeah 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 in one fund <laughs> and uh, the reality was it's a, a very volatile fund and then when it had a good good couple of years they bought and after it had a bad couple of years they sold and of course mean reversion meant that you know you should have been buying when it was doing badly uh, after a couple of years of bad results and selling when it had a couple of years of good results right but most people's instinct goes the other way and says oh, oh no you know a couple of years of bad results I'm changing my strategy. I'm chopping. Um, I'm trying something different. Um, and the know yourself part, I think, is um, it, it's a lot. Uh, well, there's probably three things you can do to to avoid these, you know, wealth destroying chop and changes. The first one is find a strategy that fits your personality. Um, so, um, uh, and when I was sort of looking into this there uh, and researching. Um, investor personalities and, and investor styles there wasn't a lot of academic research that had actually looked into you know what what style would be better for different personalities um and um a guy called jonathan myers i think had you know produced a um his own version and, and a bit of a personality test but personally i wasn't a big fan of that because some of his categories would make terrible investors you know the emotional investor probably shouldn't be <laughs> yeah shouldn't be in there at all <laughs> yeah exactly or the casual investor shouldn't be um buying their own choosing their own stocks you know um if you're not going to commit time to it you're not going to perform well um so um but but the more i looked into this the more i, I think there were a few things that stood out and one of them is um, one of the personality traits is called agreeableness. Um, and um, uh, usually being agreeable is a, a positive trait. You know, it, it means that you get on well with people. Generally, they have greater empathy. Um, you know, there's a lot of positives uh, about being agreeable. But the agreeable person finds it really hard to go against the crowd and be contrarian. Mm -hmm. So. But if you are that, you know, contrarian person, um, then deep value investing or just value investing probably fits your personality quite well. Um, if you're agreeable, being more sort of a momentum investor going with the, you know, with the crowd buying into stuff as it, it, it kind of takes off, um, it is probably much more suited to your personality. Um one thing I um, it is not in the book, but I, I thought about the other day because I was um, rereading the the snowball, the Buffett um, biography, biography um, is we, we often say, OK, Buffett transitioned from being a deep value investor, you know, after his uh, mentor Graham into being a um, quality investor because um, one, his assets scaled so much he couldn't do net nets and two he met Charlie Munger and Charlie Munger persuaded him that mm. this is the way to go. But, you know, you, you read the, the snowball and you see that what it seems Warren quite likes to be liked. You know, he, yeah. he, he you know, it, it's this kind of personality where he wants to be seen as the good guy and the, you know, and very rarely, you know, I think it was only at the top of the 1999 bubble. Did he actually speak out and say, you guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's very, um, because, very slow to judge. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
you know, it kind of makes sense when you, you view that from the lens that he, he, he probably isn't that disagreeable. He's quite an agreeable guy by all accounts. Um, so actually being this Graham net net deep value investor or taking control of a company, firing the management, rationalizing the business yeah. just probably wasn't a good fit for his personality it probably you know would have taken a lot of effort for him to do that whereas quality investing buying the and then cheerleading the great, management instead of threatening them it, it, exactly yeah 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 and and being the nice guy so he gets the good deals when they come they come you know that that's kind of it's sort of with this lens you sort of see oh actually that you know, that transition might have also been an aspect of finding a better fit with his personality rather than just um you know scale and m meeting Munger. mr Munger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense uh, mm. so question number three and we've all been there we buy something and before we know it it, it drops in half in the price and now yeah. we're, we're we have a tough question to ask ourselves <laughs> do we double down or do we stand pat or do we exit um Maybe you could explain your thoughts on that, especially in the context of these different kind of personality types almost of the assassin, the hunter, and then the rabbit. Yeah, so these these terms come from a, a book by a guy called Lee Freeman Shaw, and he um, uh, he, he was a, a, a sort of a money manager who allocated capital to other money managers, um, and fun. he could – exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he track could track their trades um, and see which ones performed and didn't perform. Um, and I think it was something like 31,000 trades over 30 managers um, that he got to analyze. Um, and he found that sort of two types of investors um, made money uh, and one type usually lost money. Um, and the two types that made money were sort of diametrically opposite in their approach. Um, you had these guys called assassins, and these are the guys who always had a stop loss. Um, you know, they're they're the um, poor Tudor Jones, you know, losers, losers, average losers. Um, you know, it's just it's gone down 10, 15, 20 percent. They were just out and gone on to the next thing. And they made money because they cut their losers short. And, you know, if they were able to hang on to their winners, they overall did quite well. Um the the second type of group that did quite well uh freeman shaw calls hunters and these guys were the guys who averaged down um uh, and they were willing to you know sort of average down not not even you know kind of once or twice but 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 multiple times and they often made money even if the stock didn't go back above the, the level original that they first purchase price yeah yes exactly um so that um you know they did really well um uh, as well um and the but the guys that did badly he called rabbits because they were like caught in the headlights the guys who did nothing tended to get run over by the market um and uh you know uh, so I, I think you know i personally average down um you know and i think it's you know because i'm a, a value investor then i'm buying something that's hated usually hopefully and it's not suddenly become going to become loved because I bought the stock, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, it's, so it can, it can become more hated. Yeah. Um, and almost probably will. <laughs> yes. Um, and probably, uh, you know, I guess this isn't strict, but my feeling is that value investors and quality investors. So, so that's guys who are um, buying for the very, very long term, you know, they're looking for, um, competitive advantages and big runways um you know and they're happy to wait 20 years to see their returns my feeling is that those guys are, are probably better off being hunters and averaging down um and the guys who are more um growth and momentum mindset are probably better off with stop losses in place um you know it's not strict but uh, that's my feeling um one word of caution i'd say for people like myself who um average down um i think there's certain situations that averaging down isn't great even for deep value investors hunters 
Um, and this is um, this comes from a guy called John Hempton, the Australian hedge yeah, fund manager. Bronte Capital, I think. Is the... Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, he, he looked into this in some detail, and his caution was, if it's highly leveraged, don't average down. Um, n- not just because it might go to zero, you know, it adds to the risk, but because um, highly leveraged companies, the management incentivized to sort of travel hopefully, you know, hope that the next big contract's coming in or because they have to report to their debt holders as well as shareholders. So, you know, what you often see with these big leverage companies is it's it's all okay, it's all okay, it's all okay. Oh, no, everything's gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and I think the, the second type he said was um, uh, uh, companies that face obsolescence you know, so Kodak, when film cameras were going out of, you know, vogue, um, you know, maybe things like newspapers, um, you know, that doesn't mean they're bad investments because a declining industry can prevent competitors and give, you know, a managed decline can give you very high returns on capital because the lack of entrance into the market. But they could also go to zero and averaging down on those is is probably not a good idea. Um, It probably gets at the the understanding what is cyclical versus secular. Yes. Which is very difficult to do, though, I think. I mean, it's it's not always obvious what's what's in a cyclical situation or what's in a a full secular decline. And you obviously don't want to double down into a secular decline. But I don't know, is uh, today would retail versus amazon be considered you know technical obsolescence by hempton i'm not sure yeah that's yeah that's a tricky one because um obviously as a as a deep value investor that a lot of retail is popping up on my screens and my um you know uh, the, the sort of things i'm tracking and mm. um even more so in the uk where we have a you know a a sort of a brexit overhang on consumer confidence um in there as well i think um the uh, yeah yeah it's probably a sector i would caution um on averaging down on for that reason but also a sector i do have some holdings in because because a lot of them are so cheap on cash flow that if they can manage the decline they will um you know they'll they, they could generate you know kind of high returns um but you'd want companies that have multi-channel wouldn't you you wouldn't want anything that doesn't have any online presence um or the ability to have um to cut costs very rapidly so people who have long large stores long rents things like that you know you, you wouldn't want to hold those even as a deep value play something that has short rents that they can renew on declining you know, rate values, things like that, you know, you, you might want to consider, in it, certainly in my opinion. Yeah. So uh, question number four, and <clears throat> I think a fair number of our, our listeners or viewers will are familiar with the Kelly criterion, but um, maybe you could explain a little bit about what makes it popular and what also then sort of upper and then lower limits on position sizing, and maybe even spe- specifically about the overconfidence bias of what people include in their portfolio, but then they completely punt on uh, the position sizing often. And this, yeah, there's yeah. this weird kind of dichotomy <laughs> and uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So the Ke- Kelly criterion for, for those don't know, uh, John, John L. Kelly um, was a sort of pioneer in the maths of, um, uh, of, of betting um, and he was made famous by a guy called Ed Thorpe, who used this Kelly criterion to um, size his um, his bets when he was cow- um, card county in Vegas. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, if you haven't read the, the the stories about it, it's you know it's worth reading just for those accounts of uh, yeah. of him, you know, this mathematician going to Vegas, yeah, and wearing and, disguises uh, and playing the, and the having playing... a computer <laughs> in his in his um, sock and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, like the the, the first, I think he he they designed the first wearable computer yeah. in order to to try and defeat um, uh, roulette in that case. Um, so so where you had these kind of relative kind of certainty of uh, of bets, then 
um, using this Kelly criterion. And it says you should bet in proportion, a proportion of your bankroll so that, you know, your total portfolio or the total amount of money you have to play with in proportion to your edge divided by your odds. And your edge is what probably we'd say was expected return in, you know, in kind of investing language. Um, and the odds are, are how much you you win when you get it, it back. Um, and these chains of, although they were games of chance, um, Thorpe had calculated fairly accurately, even without modern computers, what, what his edge was. And the odds of the game are, are, are known for Blackjack, for Roulette, what he was doing. So he was fairly certain of what sort of position size he had to put on using the Kelly formula. Because gambling which, is such a constrained universe of outcomes. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it, you know, whereas in investing, um, you, you know, your idea of what the odds the market is offering you um, or your, you know, the edge that you potentially have, um, it, you know, it, it is a big unknown. Um and one of the challenges of the Kelly criterion is it um, its risk is asymmetric. If you overbet um, in the long run, there's a non-zero chance that you wipe out. Basically, you go to zero. Almost, yeah, almost. Well, yeah. I mean, you never go Not to quite. zero because it's a proportional betting. But you know, if if you started with a hundred thousand dollars and you ended up at ten dollars, yeah. it, it, that. That distinction it's, is not asymptotic <laughs> zero. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, but the but going slightly less and reducing your position size um, is um, it is sort of um, it doesn't have a massive impact on your your overall rate of return. You're obviously reducing your rate of return, but not to you know. So, so if you go to uh, what they call half Kelly and bet half the proportion that the Kelly suggests, you're not generally halving your potential returns. Um, so um, when, you know, the analogy I use is if you were sort of, you know, climbing a mountain or approaching a cliff edge, um, you know, and it was a clear day, you'd feel quite confident at getting sort of pretty close to that edge and, you know, kind of looking, you know, maybe even looking over the edge because, you you know the risk you can see where you're going um if if it was a really foggy day and pretty windy you know you'd you'd stop a fair way short you wouldn't be like oh how how, how far can i lean over this you know this kind of thing because th again the risk is asymmetric yeah um so i, I think the yeah the you know, the Kelly, the Kelly criterion suggests you should always sort of err on the side of caution, and in um, investing, that means diversifying more than you think is necessary. Because obviously, if you intentionally reduce each position size, you are um, uh, uh, you're increasing your diversification. Um, and I think you know the, the reason that you also might be want to be cautious is most people are overconfident right so you know uh, you only have to write down what you think the outcomes are for your your potential investments and re review them a year later and you'll have found that th you know things <laughs> that have happened that you didn't dream of you know it's like you know uh, uh, and you were so certain at the time that yeah th this is the the path that this stock will take and maybe it will drop 10 percent on bad news or you know maybe it'll you know, have this issue and, you know, something completely left field will have will come about and, um, you know, positive or negative. Um, so I think you, you only have to look at those things to see. Yeah. You know, if even if you're doing a proper sort of statistical analysis um, or trying to, you will probably be overconfident uh, with your thing. And, and again, the only thing to do to sort of overcome that overconfidence is to diversify more than you think you, you really think necessary should. yeah and then yes how, exactly how, how about um how about kind of loss aversion and, and a lower limit yeah so this is something again i talk about in in the book is um when you look at most people's portfolios you know you you, you sometimes get people share portfolios online or um you see um uh 
kind of fund managers publish their portfolios as well. And, and they all seem to have this thing in common. They have a very long tail of very small positions, 0.1%, 0.3%. Um, and you think, well, you know, and they're not all option like strategies you know they're not yeah. ones that could do 100x or you know tomorrow they're, they're you know they're just normal companies and you, you sort of you go through them and you think well what's the common criteria amongst these and what you usually find is they're they're losers you know they're the ones that um you know they didn't the ones where they were the rabbit uh-huh. yeah those <laughs> you know? are rabbits in there <laughs> yeah yeah th- those are yeah you can see the rabbits in there they they didn't have the confidence to 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 average down and increase it to a reasonable position and they didn't have the you know loss aversion was stopping them selling and just you know because realistically a 0.3 percent it could double and daily noise on your portfolio would have a bigger impact than you know that that overnight doubling so um you know my uh, strategy is if anything drops below um i mean i re- run a relatively con- concentrated portfolio even though i um uh, you know I-, I try and diversify more than i need to <laughs> yeah. um so anything that drops below one percent of my portfolio i i sort of have an assessment and i say am i prepared to put more money in and if the answer is no not at the current price or the current situation from the company i just sell uh, and it it's so hard to do you know this process of taking losses is so hard to do um but it you know it, it's just so much better out of the portfolio you know uh, if it comes back on my screen and i suddenly have more confidence that it's turning around you know i can buy back in but the fact that i'm not willing to buy more at that price is generally a sign that I yeah. should be out. I mean, the only upside I could see from that would be just having something there as a reminder to kind of rub your nose in it a little bit. That uh, <laughs> you know, I, all right, this was a mistake that I don't want to make again. Yeah, like the um, the uh, uh, the bankrupt share certificate on the wall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. These kind of warts, um, warts in your portfolio that you you can't get rid of. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I can, I can see that, but I also think that just seeing those can take an emotional energy. It can sort of, um, you know, like kind of track it. Well, there's a time that you will take tracking those that might not be, you know, kind of Fruitful. valid or necessary. Yeah. yeah. And also there is this emotional, um, you know, if you can manage that emotion of, okay, this is a warning, I don't know, not to invest in um, uh, co- you know, companies with technical obsolescence, or you know, it's a specific lesson. I can see the point, but um, I think even then, you know, the the downside of in keeping investing emotional energy there could be could be a negative. So yeah, just um, add it to your checklist and then sell it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, question number five: uh, What did what is oxytocin and empathy and a lot of other things that we often don't associate with with the stock market necessarily have to do with particularly story stocks, uh, maybe things that are more what we call like high growth or glamour sometimes it's called? Yeah, I, I guess the sort of um, my my thoughts around story stocks, you know, would be those story, those stocks that have a very good story attached to them, um, but probably yeah, maybe pre-revenue and a certainly pre-profit you know the sort of stuff that's um you know kind of very highly rated um and um I- experience would tell most investors that they're not very good at picking these <laughs> you uh-huh. know that um that most story stocks on average are poor investments um and and the question is well what why do we keep getting drawn to these you know that they, they can be like a you could be like a moth to the flame for these things you know they're going to hurt you but you still sort of keep coming back to them yeah um and there could be a uh, there could be an aspect of lottery seeking you know people like to gamble people like to lottery seek but i think uh, there's something deeper here which is that um and it's the way our brains respond to stories um you know we um you know, we really like to hear stories when, you know, if I describe a, a story to you, 
um, it will be far more engaging than the same things as a list of facts. Um, and it's because, you know, when, when I describe a, a visual scene or a sound or a motion or a smell, the parts of your brain that are responsible for these light up. It's, it's almost like your brain experiences the story as if you're, um, it. you know, uh, in it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and we yeah you know, we enjoy that far more because our brain is engaged. We we get greater enjoyment. We get greater um, it, uh, you know kind of engagement with that story. You know, uh, uh, well I might be doing you a disservice here, but my feeling is that Charlie Munger read your book all the way to the end, not because he thought, oh I'm gonna you know the last few pages I'm gonna learn how a, a new way of valuing. Um, uh, 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 you know, types of companies, but because he found the the story engaging, and he wanted to know how it how it ended, and he was emotionally engaged with that, um, you know, that particular narrative. Um, yeah, and I think uh, also I, I must have caught him at a, a weak moment around the holidays too. That uh, <laughs> when it when he read it. Yeah, yeah, t- timing is everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um. Yeah. So the um, but the, the that emotional um, empathy as well is particularly strong, and this is where um, oxytocin comes in. It's one of the the brain hormones, and it's it's often called the um, the cut the cuddle hormone um, because it's it's released when we sort of make a meaningful connection with <clears throat> other people, and actually enc- you know, encourages us to then. F- feel a bond feel a connection to those people um so um you know ch- charities know this because you know w- when you when you get the the charity leaflet it always describes one person the the impact of a disaster on one person rather than the stats of the number of people who are affected because the the, the one um, story engages your empathy and engages your, um, you know, uh, releases this oxytocin. And one of the aspects is you trust people more. So you will trust that charity more. Um, and you can, you know, uh, and I think as well, sort of emotional responses release dopamine, which is one of the enjoyment um, hormones in your brain as well. And it helps you remember things more accurately so if you go to a corporate presentation and you see um this ceo um you know give this amazing presentation for this this idea um you know the emotion might be it saves lives or it's revolutionizing an industry or you know uh, or the motion might just be oh i think i'll make a lot of money you know i, I will personally benefit from <laughs> you know f- from this idea um but the fact that you emotionally engage with it means you will trust the, you know, one, you'll listen more, you'll be more mm. engaged with the story than some, you know, maybe boring consumer defensive presentation. Um, you will remember stuff more. So it'll, you'll be able to recall it more easily when you're going through, you know, potential investments, it'll come to mind more easily. And finally, you'll trust the guy, you know, and I'm not saying that, story stock CEOs are all untrustworthy, but I think it's probably fair to say that they are often optimistic. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you will have trusted their optimistic purport, you know, um, investment thesis more than you probably should have um, because you liked and enjoyed the story. So yeah, your um, that oxytocin is a, is a skepticism deadener. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It sort of removes it removes the skepticism from your mind, and um, uh, I mean, I think the it's really hard to overcome. Like all of these biases, I think probably the only thing you could potentially do is say if you have a history of badly choosing pre-revenue, pre-profit stocks, is you say I will just never buy a pre-revenue, pre-profit you know, stock because if you don't have a history of picking them well then you know you you're you're likely to be the uh the overly trusting <laughs> yeah um oxytocin loaded <laughs> um investor so bonus question that we always ask and this is for a book recommendation 
Um, so this is probably the book I talk to people most about, uh, and it's called Influence by uh, Robert. I think it's Cialdini or, or Cialdini. I can yeah. never Chial, never know Chial, the Cialdini. I think. I mean, I've heard ten different versions. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I should. I, I mean, he's been on some podcasts, so I should have listened to how he pronounced his name. <laughs> yeah, smart. but um, uh, yeah, the uh, it, it it's probably. I, I mean, it's the book I, uh, I I like books that change your mindset on things, and and this really is one that you know changes my or changed my mindset. Um, the background is he's this um, academic psychology researcher and he's looking into what influences people. Um, but he reaches the limitation of what he can research in the in the lab, you know, on students. Um, and he's also I, I think he's this, the self-proclaimed sucker. So he's the guy who falls for the pretty girl selling gym memberships on his doorstep or the, um, you know, the, uh, the competition for, you know, phone this number for this competition and, uh, and all those kind of things. Um, and he's like, what, you know, he's sort of going, why, you know, why do I fall for this? And it, his genius was going, right, I'm going to become one of those marketers. So he, I think he became a used car salesman. He ran multi-leg multi-level marketing yeah uh, you know parties, parties for, yeah. exactly yeah run tupperware parties um you know kind of did all those things but it in each case he took their sales manuals and he actually analyzed them and came up with well why do these things influence this and um it, yeah i think he came up with six um six things that you know all of them had you know one of these six things so they're things like liking if somebody likes me um, uh, you know I, i'm more likely to be influenced exactly um reciprocation if somebody gives me something i feel an obligation to give it back um uh well uh what are the others uh, scarcity so if you know it's the 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 countdown sale on on amazon or something you know you you, yeah. you, you a false scarcity gives you this idea um social proof so you it's usually a good decision to just do what everybody else is doing but it, you know, it's why marketers have phrases like um, eight out of 10 cats prefer whiskers, you know, because you think, well, oh, if, if if everybody else is buying whiskers, my must cat. Be good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of revealing these. Uh, uh, what's the other? Oh, yeah. So um, authority is another one. So you tend to just do what, you know, if, uh, which is why TV doctors promote health products. And you're like, why? What? You know why would you know just because you play doctor somebody in some soap opera why yeah. <laughs> why would why would it make a difference but you know our, our minds go oh that person's a doctor so the authority you know the 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 skepticism again turns off and we say yeah you know I'll, i must buy that product it must work because well he does have TV a lab doctor so and so it must be <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> oh and some of the you know the scary things you see um some of these shows where they, you know, somebody puts on a high visibility jacket and they just assume, supposedly Banksy, you know, with all his art murals, just puts on a high visibility jacket um, and cordons somewhere off. And nobody bothers him because he's wearing a high visibility jacket. So it doesn't matter. He's tagging, you know, he's using graffiti or something as well. He's wearing a high visibility jacket. He must, must be, doing be what a he's supposed to be doing. <laughs> Exactly. I, what I found um, really interesting about that book was that I, my understanding is that Cialdini wrote it to help educate everyone to not be taken advantage of, but that yes, turned out yes. that it was basically only read by people who then have used it to to take more advantage of people. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that's why he wrote the the follow up uh, Persuasion, which is also a, a a great book, and is you know his sort of. Um, his theory for that one is, well, how do you create the environment that your message is going to be kind of be best received? Um, and, you know, uh, I guess he sort of talks a bit a little bit about that, about the ethical, <laughs> the ethical quandaries around, you know, <laughs> empowering the marketers more. But, um, you know, it's definitely helped for me, you know, just seeing these ways that we're influenced. Um, you know, I, I see it in the markets. I see it in the 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 post that comes from my door and it has definitely equipped me to kind of you know have better defenses against these these sort of things so 
heartily recommended. Well, that's good. Uh, so, Mark, thanks for coming on the show today, and uh, thank you for writing your book, Excellent Investing, and um, it was a real pleasure. Yeah, it's brilliant. Thank you for having me on, Jake. It's very much appreciated. Before you go, do me the huge honor of picking up your copy of The Rebel Allocator, available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. It's a business person's guide to effective capital allocation, told in a coming-of-age story of a college grad who crosses paths with a wealthy Midwesterner. It's fiction for the nonfiction reader. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to 5GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks. Happy reading.